Late this week, the Sri Lankan High Commissioner to Australia, Mr Seneca Walgam Pyre, brought into debate over the future of his country. Among other things, controversially, he claimed there was no reason for Australia to accept Tamil refugees from the Civil War on either political or humanitarian grounds. At the same time, international calls are emerging at the UN and EU levels for a war crimes investigation into the behaviour of both the Tamil Tigers and the Sri Lankan government in the last days of the conflict, which has left as many as 300,000 people, mainly Tamils, displaced. I spoke with the High Commissioner from Canberra. High Commissioner, thanks very much for your time. Um, after so many years, a quarter of a century, of bitter conflict between Tamils and non-Tamil Sri Lankans, it's really almost impossible for the rest of us to understand that that could ever be resolved, particularly by a military victory. You're not suggesting that that's really going to change the deep-seated antagonism between the two sides? Well, I like to distinguish here between the Tamils and the LTTE. Right. The Sri Lankan government has been waging a war against terrorism. It's war against the LTTE. But the Tamils are part of Sri Lanka, and the Sinhalese have no problems at all with the Tamils. In fact, more than 50% of the Tamils live in areas outside the North and East. They have been living so for last centuries. And there have been no problem between the Sinhalese and the Tamil. It's really a handful of terrorists that have been causing all these problems. Could, could you, we talk about the area where the battle was fought so ferociously in the last few weeks. What about the people who were displaced there? We hear figures like 300,000 people are displaced as a result of that conflict. What is your government actually doing about that? And why, in fact, can't aid agencies, media like ourselves, get into that area now that you say the military action is over to see for ourselves what the situation is? Well, there are, in fact, 52 NGOs who are in the, the IDP camps now. So they are permitted to come there now. And the government is facing a colossal task of... There are about 276,000 refugees there right. in the camps at the moment. Right. And the government is stressed to the maximum, but it's providing uh, housing, sanitation, food, humanitarian assistance, medical supplies. Well, why is and it then that this week, sir, why is it that this week the Red Cross have said they can't work there, given the conditions that apply from your government? The Red Cross have pulled out. No Red Cross is there today. My, my, my understanding is the Red Cross is still there. It is functioning. The ICRC is there. Well, I vote that's not our information. But that, that said, what about the media? What would happen, for instance, if I said to you that on Monday morning I'd like to have on your desk an application for a visa to visit your country with a television crew and go to the areas where that battle was fought over the last few weeks and move about the north and the east and, in fact, anywhere in your country they wanted to go to see for ourselves the situation as it exists now. A, could I get that visa? And B, could I go anywhere in your country if I did? No, now that the battle is finished, I think the, the concerns of the security of the, the media and the people that the Sri Lankan government entertained earlier would no longer be there. You, you think, so you think but could the, I? You think, yes. but could I apply for a visa and get it? Well, you could certainly try, and we'll have to, because I we have to get instructions from Colombo. But I don't think there should be any problem now. Earlier, the media was not, not allowed to come into the conflict zone purely for the safety of the media personnel themselves, because as you know, the area was heavily mined by the LTTE, and if one media person got killed or injured, then the Sri Lankan government would have been responsible. But at the, fact, at the moment, with your, at the moment with your military in control, that shouldn't be a problem now, should it? No, that's why I said it should not be a problem now. Right. So there would be freedom of movement. We could go to the camps where the displaced people are, see for ourselves the condition under which they're living, because that situation has been described as being in the same class, bad class, in the, sa in the same state as places like Darfur in Africa and Gaza in the Middle East, that people are living under appalling, horrific conditions. I completely reject that suggestion for the reason that the government, up to last week, they had 190-odd thousand refugees and they provided them the maximum facilities possible. Now, suddenly, in the last week, another 50, 60,000 came in. So the government, the facilities are stretched to a maximum, but under given 
circumstances, the government is doing its best to provide everything for them. But, so the government has not been remiss at all. How, how do you feel about the fact that uh, there are the EU, for instance, and the UN, and even the British Foreign Minister, David Miliband, said that there are very grave allegations of war crimes that went on there on both sides of the conflict. They should be properly investigated. I know it's a pretty horrible term to talk to, to use with a diplomat, but war crimes is very serious stuff, and there are people in the world who believe that that possibly went on in your country, not just over 25 years, but particularly most recently, right? and that needs to be investigated. No, I must take quite categorically that Sri Lankan government cannot, under any circumstances, be held to be guilty of any war crimes. As you know, in the last, say, maybe a month or so, the Sri Lankan military forces, they have carried out the largest humanitarian relief operation ever. The, all, all the people were held hostage by the LTTE as human shields. And it's the Sri Lankan government forces which provided, at the risk of their own lives, the when the Sri Lankan government gave two humanitarian pauses, the LTTE built fortifications and the, with, with the equipment that was given to the, to the NGOs at the time of the last tsunami, probably contributed by the Australian government too, the LTTE did not use all this heavy equipment and machinery right. for development, humanitarian system, but kept them to they built fortifications. I don't, I, don't think anybody, Lanka, I don't think anybody, sir, would try to absolve the way the LTTE behaved. You know, it was quite abominable and inexcusable on so many occasions. Nobody's disputing that. But if, as you said, there's nothing for the Sri Lankan government, well, the Sri Lankan government is not trying to hide anything, if there were to be a UN request for an inquiry into what actually went on there, on both sides, would your government agree and be party to that, if you have nothing to hide? But Ali... But allegation of war crimes itself is a very serious thing. Sure. Unless there is a fundamental, uh, unless there is some prima facie case of war crimes, such an allegation should not be made. It is for that reason that the Sri Lankan government has rejected the allegation. There is not an iota of evidence to say the Sri Lankan government well, I'll take, I'll take has, that as a no. has been guilty of any war crimes. I'll take that as a no, that you wouldn't cooperate with even the UN if they wanted to investigate. Well, what I say is that there is no, no evidence whatsoever to say that Sri Lankan government is guilty of war crimes. On the contrary, Sri Lankan government must be commended by the International Committee for wiping out terrorism. You know that LTE was the most, most ruthless terrorist organization. And our government has suffered so much. Our civilians have suffered so much. Our security forces have suffered so much in this process. And they, at the risk of their own lives, they rescued nearly now uh, 276,000 civilians from the clutches of the LTTE. Mr. High Commissioner, just finally, um, 25, 26, some people say even longer years of, of bitter conflict in your country as a result of this civil war. How long do you think it will take to rebuild your country so that there's any semblance of peace, unity, democracy, the sort of things that you and your Prime Minister, President, are aspiring to? Sri Lankan government has pledged to hold elections, local elections, by the end of the year, and thereafter, hopefully, provincial council elections. And to, and to so displa the, the displaced people, how, lo how long will it take you to make those displaced people no longer displaced? Uh, government hopes to at least settle by 80% of the displaced people in their old homes by the end of the year. Well, that's a bit of a task for the reason that the LTT has heavily mined all the areas. So as soon as the demining operations are complete, the government has pledged to do that. High Commissioner, thank you very much for your time. We know it's a very, very complex situation, and thanks very much for sharing your views with us today. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, George. Thank you.